Good morning and happy Juneteenth. Welcome to the final day of the QCEF 2021 uh, conference, Forging Futures Through Black Educational Histories. My name is Shalegra Moy, and I have the honor and blessing of being the program director of the Heinz Fellows Program here in the Center for Urban Education at the University of Pittsburgh. We wanna welcome you to uh, our plenary discussion this morning, which is a history of the Heinz Fellows Program from 2017 through 2021. Um, we have um, just a few of our fantastic team of 15 fellows who are here to join us this morning. Um, and we will also be taking questions in the Q&A uh, function. So please use that um, to send us your questions. And at the end, uh, we'll open that up and have some time for dialogue back and forth. Um, this next screen here talks a little bit about what the program um, has been and has done over the course of four years. And so our primary responsibility is to build the knowledge, attitudes, dispositions, and skills and leadership of the people who are recruited to the Heinz Fellows Program so that they can effectively support equity practices in urban public schools throughout the Pittsburgh region. Uh, we've been in um, the K through 12 space um, and we've actually expanded our program from uh, initially being in three schools in the Hill District of Pittsburgh to serving Allegheny County. Um, there are five particular competency, competencies that we really um, spend, I would say, the majority of our year um, really delving deeply into, and that's the urban context, tutoring and teaching, mentoring and social support, participatory action research, and arts and technology. Um, and these are five competencies that we have found that really support the overall and continued growth and development and sustainability of the program itself. Um, one of the things that we do really well in the Heinz Fellows Program is authentically engage with our local community-based organizations, uh, school officials, district officials, parents and families, um, and students particularly. Um, the Heinz Fellows Program is composed of a two-part kind of process, which is uh, being embedded in our school partners throughout the course of an academic school year, as well as the professional learning experiences that Heinz Fellows participate in here in the Center for Urban Education and at the School of Education um, at Pitt at large. Um, we have weekly seminars, um, we have a weekly ongoing professional learning um, where we um, have the privilege of sitting with um, national scholars, um, local scholars and historians. Um, we learn from parents directly and so, you know, we really cultivate um, the spirit of, you know, inviting students, inviting parents, and inviting caregivers into our program um, to deliver that professional education to us. And uh, probably one of the most important things we do, and this really relates back to building those uh, knowledge, attitudes, disposi dispositions, and skills, is participating in uh, reflective and critical discussions um, with ourselves, um, with scholars, with colleagues, um, because we understand that, you know, the learning and the transformation really takes place inside of us, right? And that's how we're able to transform the environments that we go into. Um, and then one of the really key components of what we do in the Heinz Fellows Program is to participate in a sustainable action research project each year. Um, the projects look as different as our school sites do. The projects are, are as different as the um, diversity and experience and um, expertise of the Heinz Fellows who are in each of those school sites supporting them. And um, with that, I am going to turn it over to Dakota um, to start um, our introductions of the Heinz Fellows um, who comprise the 2020-2021 school year. Dakota? Thank you, Allegra. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for spending some time with us this morning. Um, and I will try to not feel like this is a really awkward virtual experience of me not being able to see any of your faces. So my name is Dakota rotino Gorilli. Um, I use the pronoun she, her, hers, or they, them, theirs. And I um, have been Heinz Fellow two times. 
So my first term as a Heinz Fellow was in the 2017-2018 cohort at Pittsburgh Malayan 6 through 12. It's also sometimes called University Prep. Um, I was in the middle school there. And this year I am at Woodland Hills High School. Um, one of the projects that I've worked on in my time at Woodland Hills this year is an after school group for LGBTQ students. It was a digital support group where we met via the application Discord. Um, and we spent some time talking about positive identity development, political activism, and other topics that the students were interested in. Um, my why for engaging in this work is that in all the years that I was a student in the school system and in all the years that I have worked inside of school systems, I have seen how we uh, push in particular black and brown students and LGBTQ students out of schools. And I'm interested in working with those students to find ways of creating more equitable and liberatory school environments. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Rachel, so that she can introduce herself. Thank you, Dakota. Um, so my name is Rachel Hopkins. I use she, her pronouns. Um, uh, this, is, this is my first year in the fellowship and I served at Manchester Academic Charter School this year. Um, one of my major projects this year was a professional development experience for educators that Rodney, who's also here, and Victoria Blyweiss, who is not, um, co-created with me. We did it together. Um, we created a survey um, where we captured student experiences, student needs in the virtual learning context, as well as teachers, um, their experiences, their needs, their strategies, um, and then created a discussion space for students, for teachers to, um, to contend with what it looks like to uplift equity in the digital classroom. Um, that's what we entitled the presentation, Uplifting Equity in the Digital Classroom. Um, and it was really important to us to elevate student voices, student choices, and student needs. Um, and that is what my why is. As a student, I was often asked to leave my identity at the door when I came into learning spaces. Um, and that's something that I want to challenge as I engage in this program and as I support K-12 urban schools moving forward. Um, I will popcorn it over to Meg. Good morning, everybody. My name is Meg Booth. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. So I'm a first year fellow. And this year I worked with Miller African Centered Academy here in the Hill District. The projects I mainly worked on this year were revolving around family engagement with the PSCC planning meetings um, and really just giving, creating space for parents and family members to come and, and voice their opinions, ask questions, but also participate in um, their children's education. And also I facilitated an art club at Chinley Heights Community Development Project, also in the Hill District this year with fourth and fifth grade students. So, um, my why is also prior to joining the fellowship, I'd always really enjoyed working with young people, but I found myself constantly being frustrated um, and what figuring out why or how I can work with young people in more just sustainable ways, um, specifically for students who are often marginalized or invisibilized in school contexts. And myself being from Pittsburgh, I was really interested to kind of understand, not from a student perspective, what um, schools in Pittsburgh are like. And I will popcorn Spencer. Hello, um, my name is Spencer Scott. I, <laughs> I was no longer a fellow at the end of the year, but I started out as a fellow um, and I was a second year fellow. Um, I ended up taking another position uh, in another department. Um, my why is to essentially give um, little black boys and girls a, an opportunity to see what um, could be. Um, I grew up in a space where there wasn't an op many opportunities, but I wanted students to understand that, you know, regardless of where you start, it's not your fault where you start, but it is your fault if you stay there um, for as long um, as you do not put in effort. Um, I think it's very important to um, to build um, up our little boys and girls to give them an opportunity to understand that that, that their voice matters, um, to give them other opportunities to express themselves in any possible way 
that they could think of and they can fathom and understand, help them understand that wherever they want to go, um, that they have support. So um, I think I want to popcorn to Rodney. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rodney Gaskins AC. I go by the He series. And I'm also a first year, I'm a first year fellow, and I served at Manchester Academic Charter. Um, I served um, a fourth grade classroom and also eighth grade classes. Um, one of the programs, um, shout out to my colleagues, Rachel and uh, Victoria, we also had ran a virtual lunch program at the very beginning for almost like half the school year and we called it Club Max. We had seen that students were kind of not basically being able to talk to their friends during lunchtime. And so we had came up with the idea to kind of just provide a safe Zoom space for them to play games, just have conversation and just kind of express themselves and kind of let out some energy because um, the Zoom days were just long. Um, and so it provided them just the space to kind of be themselves. And that also kind of translates into my why. I am extremely big on authentic expression. I am big on um, just being yourself, authenticity, um, knowing oneself, and also how that can translate back into one's grasp and knowledge of education. And so my aim this year was to give kids that that power, that inspiration. Um, and just for me also looking like them showing that representation that they can basically dream, be whoever they wanna be, um, apply themselves, how they wanna apply themselves and get to where they know that they can go. And if they don't know, me trying to provide some of the confidence in them so that they have it to carry it out throughout life. And I want to say that's everybody, unless Shalegra, you want to go again? <laughs> I'm going to, thank you, Rodney. I'm going to, Shalegra and I have one more thing that we want to say um, before we move forward. So as you look at the screen, you can see um, a screenshot here of one of our days of summer onboarding. So this picture would have been taken um, a little under a year ago. You can tell from the fact that those of us who you see here today have uh, much different hair length compared to this photo. But so uh, I wanted to introduce the folks who are not here presenting with us today, but who have been participating in QCEF all week and some of whom are likely watching this presentation right now. So I'm gonna move from the top left of this photo through the folks that you have not yet met. So in the top left corner, we have Victoria Blyweiss. She uh, was a third year fellow this year. And as Rodney said, she was with Rachel and Rodney at Manchester Academic Charter School. Next to Shalegra to her right in that photo is Matthew Spemer. Um, he served at Pittsburgh Obama. Then we have Angela Rent, who was at Pittsburgh Westinghouse. In the second row, there's Haley Porter, who was also at Pittsburgh Obama. Then there's me. Christopher Darby, who was alongside me at Woodland Hills High School, as well as Jasmine Howard, who was alongside me at Woodland Hills High School. In the third row, we have Daniel DeZoden, who served with me at University Prep in the first year of the program and stayed on. Um, this was his fourth year, and he was also at Westinghouse High School. Erica Roberts, who was at Pittsburgh Weill, Jordan Pollard, who was at Pittsburgh Westinghouse. You've met Rachel, you've met Meg, you've met Spencer. And so the last person who you haven't met in the fourth row is Mark Brentley Jr., who also was serving at Pittsburgh Weill. And Shalegra, I know that you had a few things you wanted to say as well. Yes, thank you. And so I'll start with Mark, who is also a fourth year um, fellow in the program, um, has served Weill um, exceedingly well and has just earned a master's in social work from the University of Pittsburgh. And so uh, Mark was a 2021 uh, graduate and we are really, really proud of that. Um, we've got Spencer who is so modest. Um, some of you may recognize him as DJ Pivo. Um, he also has uh, started in the University of Pittsburgh School of Social Work um, pursuing a master's of social work degree. 
we have Christopher Darby, who was a second year fellow, um, who was um, a doctoral student here in the urban ed program at um, the University of Pittsburgh, who has accepted a, um, uh, attendance at the University of South Florida, where he'll be um, finishing his PhD studies there. Um, we've got Erica Roberts, who graduated from Duquesne University in the spring of 2021 with a master's degree in public policy. She has also um, moved on to another position. She's actually the community school coordinator at University Prep. And so um, we're exceedingly proud of her and happy that she is still gonna be serving students and families um, and our school partners well in her new role. Uh, Victoria um, has also been accepted into the out of school time learning EDD here at the University of Pittsburgh. And Jordan Pollard also completed an MSW here at the School of Social Work at Pitt and has been accepted um, into a PhD program in school uh, psychology at the University of Cincinnati. And so um, I just couldn't be more proud of, you know, the way that these fellows um, both here in the presentation today, as well as those who are, um, as Dakota said, have been supporting QCEF in a variety of ways um, all week and really supporting all of the efforts of the Center for Urban Education, um, how they're all going on to pursue, you know, further education and continuing with their why in the support of students, families, and our urban school partners. Um, and so thank you for allowing me to um, shout them out, Dakota, and I'm going to turn the mic back over to you. Thank you. So um, before we get into a more specific view of best practices, highlights, and challenges from this program year that we have, uh, that we're in the process of wrapping up, we wanted to give you a more retrospective view of the Heinz Fellows Program at the University of Pittsburgh. So I would be remiss first if I did not mention that the Heinz Fellows Program originated as a project funded by the Heinz Endowments which was originally a partnership with Duquesne University to increase um, the pipeline for black male teachers in the Pittsburgh region. And so there were two program years where um, black men from around the country came to Pittsburgh to receive education um, to go on to become school teachers while supporting schools throughout the Pittsburgh public schools. Um, and then after a year of review and reframing the program's mission, Heinz brought the program to the Center for Urban Education under the leadership of then center director, Dr. Richard Milner, as well as uh, Dr. Kenny Donaldson, who was at that time an EDD student at the University of Pittsburgh. And the framework of the program changed when it moved to Pitt to recruit a more diverse cadre of social justice educators with a focus on influencing equity practices and tutoring and mentoring students within the public schools we served so that we could be more holistically addressing issues of equity and inequity in Pittsburgh's public schools. And so we were no longer only focusing on classroom education, but we focused on co-curricular work, after school programming, community partnerships, et cetera. And so another major focus of that first year was to really intentionally develop a deep relationship with the Hill District neighborhood in Pittsburgh. So those of you who are watching who are from Pittsburgh know that, and many of you who are not from Pittsburgh would also know, that the Hill District has a history of rich cultural diversity and in particular Black excellence. Um, and it was also and has been and continued to be a neighborhood that the city of Pittsburgh has really um, left behind and mistreated in attempts to turn it into a business corridor and attempts to gentrify the neighborhood. And so we wanted to be very intentional um, with our approach to say that we were situating ourselves within Hill District schools in order to work with the cultural strengths and gifts that already existed in that community among the students and among the uh, school communities that we were serving. We also wound up working to develop mental wellness, positive identity, and arts-based resources for young people as part of that overall mission. And some of our projects that year were an attempt to help to meet material needs for families and communities as well. 
Um, some highlights of that year, because we were situated specifically in the Hill District neighborhood, we wound up developing really strong community partnerships with places like the Center That Cares, Macedonia Face, um, the Hill CDC, um, and other community centers and programs throughout the Hill District. And it was the first year of a new program. And so I think a lot of us came in with a ton of energy and a ton of external support to push us through that year and really invest in some creative projects. However, alongside that, since it was the first year of a new program, there was some ambiguity about our role. Um, and there was the potential to go in many different directions, which a lot of us did. And there were at times questions as to whether all of those directions complemented each other and whether all of those efforts were um, moving in a holistic forward direction that was sustainable. Um, and also, we knew that we would need six to 12 months to really begin to build relationships and establish the program's presence in the Hill District community. And so by the end of the program year, a lot of the work that we were doing that pushed into year two um, had really, in some ways, just begun. And so that first year, I think that we really successfully created some forward momentum. But I do think that there were fellows who felt by the end of the year um, that if we had only known what we knew at the end of the year, at the beginning, we may have had some different experiences. But I think that that's likely true of any new university community partnership. I think we're going to move on to year two now. All right, so year two, forging deeper connections. Um, again, we found it um, necessary and practical to really uh, concentrate on the reflective practices that had been introduced um, and that we were trying to strengthen within our own personal identities that we might be able to translate that um, effectively to our school partners. Um, because we are a research project, um, the Heinz Fellows Program has been a multi-year research project. Um, the value and beauty of that is that at the end of every year, you know, we complete a program evaluation um, that we share with the Heinz Endowments, but we also take that, uh, the results of that, right? And we think about um, how we can integrate that into program plan and design um, for the upcoming year. And so one of the things that, you know, came out of that evaluative process um, was that we really needed to spend some time on social justice education and socio-emotional learning that was equity and asset um, framed for the students that we were working with. Um, the cohort of Heinz Fellows um, typically turns over by, I want to say, at least 50% from year to year. And so while we did retain um, several of our fellows uh, from the year one cohort, we also welcomed um, you know, just as many, um, and there are typically 15 fellows that start each program year. Um, and so as you can imagine, um, you know, we had to do a lot of that relationship building internally. Um, again, you know, there was uh, the time that needed to be set, um, setting and resetting and re-evaluating um, our community norms that we might actually forge those deeper connections again within our cohort internally um, and then be able to translate that out to our um school partners that we were working with. And so in year two, we were still very much embedded in the Hill District neighborhood. Um, so still working very closely with uh, UPREP, always repping, very proud of that. Um, we were still working with um, the Wild Elementary School and Pittsburgh Miller uh, African Centered Academy. And so some of the highlights that came out of year two, particularly as it relates to our FOCA, um, was that we were able to write, and by we, I mean the Heinz Fellows um, who were serving that 
school site, uh, Victoria Blyweiss and Mark Brentley Jr. Um, they were able to write and were awarded um, significant grant monies um, that came into um, the Wild School family to support the socio-emotional learning and well-being um, and even the social justice education of the students um, that they serve there. Um, with part of that uh, grant money, they were able to um, bring in um, professional development workshops for the teaching staff at Weill. Um, and so that was a, a really great program. Um, and a lot of what was introduced in year two in relation to the um, social justice education and socio-emotional learning has really been sustained in the while um, school family. Um, and many of those projects that were developed as a result of that grant money are still in existence today. Um, one of the other highlights that we found in year two um, was um, our first time, um, our first foray into summer immersion experiences, right? And so what we learned from year one to year two, um, because of the diversity of the fellows that we recruited to the program, um, who maybe did not have any educational background, you know, maybe didn't have any um, prior public education experience with students, um, we realized that it would be really helpful and, and really um, effective if those folks, and even those who, you know, did have those strengths in working with young people, um, for them to have an opportunity to um, see student learning um, and well-being in action. Um, for some of the fellows, it ended up being that the students that they connected with in the summer um, immersion uh, programs were students that they then began to work with during the school year. And so it was really a critical um, and really effective way to strengthen uh, the relationships. And again, even thinking about, you know, how how hard we work to, to, to develop and sustain our community relationships. Um, the summer immersion experience really allowed us to do that um, in a new and different and innovative way. Um, and so what really came out of that in terms of highlights were a multitude of student support projects um, across all of our school sites. Um, challenges because there there always are you know what we really found um was that we were still experiencing role ambiguity um in our school sites um and really a misalignment of the the values and the mission and the mission and the ethos right of the Heinz fellows program uh in conjunction with some of the priorities um of our school district um, and even school-based partners. And so that continued to really be a challenge for us to, to work around uh, in year two. Um, one of the other challenges that we found, you know, as again, we did that end of year evaluation, um, we always um, have Heinz Fellows um, participate in data collection so that we, you know, learn um, what their personal experiences are in this program, in addition to how they're experiencing being embedded in an urban education site. Um, and what we really learned is that we missed um, some really um, significant, significant opportunities um, within our own internal cohort um, for critical identity and intersectionality um, exploration. And again, because our um, program design shifts from year to year, because the participants in the program shift from year to year, um, we're just really learning and appreciating um, that that work has to start at the beginning of every program. It has to be ongoing throughout every program year. Um, and, you know, it was a challenge and one that I feel like we, you know, have began to address better and better with each, um, each, you know, successive year of the program. Um, anybody who is here um, that wants to add anything about year two before I turn it back over to um, whoever's taking the year three slide. All right, um, I'm not sure who's on year three. That is I. Um, so hello again, everyone. Um, one thing I did forget to mention is that I spent time in at uh, Miller African Center Academy uh, both years. 
Um, I started out with third grade, transitioned with them to fourth grade uh, to maintain some of those interactions and some of the things that we uh, started um, the year before. Um, and because of, of course, COVID, um, you know, I had to come back to, you know, finish some work uh, this year. Uh, but for sticking to year three, um, year three was a very interesting year um, because it allowed it for the entire group. Um, we were trying to understand um, outside of just school, where were students learning? How did they, you know, gain their understanding of life, understanding of knowledge, um, in which ways did they understand that they learn? Um, a lot of students said, you know, I learned a lot on the playground, but I don't get good grades. Uh, I don't get grades for being on the playground. And so, you know, a lot of those conversations had to continue because, you know, helping them understand that learning is very, um, it's not linear. It's not linear at all. And we wanted to continue to allow them to, well, not allow, but continue to show them that, you know, you're learning everywhere you go. You're learning in your community. You're learning at the barbershop. You're learning um, at the YMCA. Um, and a lot of students didn't believe that, didn't understand that, or didn't grasp that at first. And then we helped them, we sat down and helped them um, picture the different things that they, you know, did. Um, and another thing we did, we um, did community building activities. Um, we, um, Build relationships through critical mentoring, um, pre-COVID, um, and you know during this onset. And also, um, one of the things that we um, did, we um, did PS. Well, specifically um, with us, we did kind of PSSA restorative circles. Um, although the circles never happened um, due to COVID. Um, we had closet and uniforms, um, closets for uniform and clothing. Um, Wild had the Wild Closet and Miller had, just had a closet for students who and families who needed uh, clothing for their uh, children. Um, we, we wanted to help children recognize their power and their voice to affirm them. Um, to give them an understanding that, you know, as I said earlier, that their voice matters. Um, we encourage them to be self-advocates. Um, a lot of those social justice and uh, SEL uh, components transfer from year two. Um, we each had um, we each had a um, a mentoring um, component as well. And also, year three was um, the year that we started with Max and Pittsburgh Obama. Um, and we transitioned mid-year from uh, UPrep. Um, another thing that we wanted to make sure we did, we wanted to uh, infuse Afro Afrocentric culture through students' uh, lives daily. Um, and some of the mentoring programs that we had were like boxing. Um, I had a DJ program for students. Uh, we practiced mindfulness as well as um, I think um, at Wild, there was a running program for girls, um, as well as um, a holistic health club. Um, and um, this year actually helped me more specifically uh, see how important it is to build relationships, not only with the students, but also with the uh, families as well. Because when COVID happened, it actually um, displaced me from some students um, that I didn't have, you know, the contact information because a lot of the schools wasn't sure what they were trying to do and how they were going to move forward. So a lot of the things that, you know, happened were we were having to call students and say, hey, do you have your friend's number? Um, and a lot of them, you know, were really missing their friends. A lot of them wanted to go back to school. Of course, you had some who, was like, who were like, you know, I don't really care to go back, but, um, I do miss my friends. So, and we noticed how important those social components were um, for um, the students. And one of the things that I wanted to uh, highlight 
um, is that we did the to Tony Morrison uh, big, bo big Box Freedom Creation that allows students to uh, build their own utopia that, um, and imagine life uh, in those spaces. Um, and we did that with um, my wife, uh, Dr. Kirsten Scott. Um, and I, I truly appreciate Q um, for allowing this space to actually happen um, because it actually taught me and um, another, uh, well, some more of my colleagues. Um, and it, it, we actually had conversations about it and we talked about the growth that happened um, at the onset and then how we grew after the fact because it allowed us to um, use our creative abilities uh, to not only reach the students, but um, stay in connection with the teachers as well. Um, and once we came back, um, virtually, it was a mess. Uh, <laughs> because not only did already, we didn't know specific clear roles and understandings of, of the space, but when you add that um, component of virtually at its own set, it really just went left for some people. Um, some people, most people thrive, um, but they did have their hiccups as well. So, um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Um, and you know, as you were sharing that year three experience, I remembered, um, that how well we shift with our circumstances, right, in the Heinz Fellows Program. So in year two and year three, we had um, changes in leadership that were both challenges and highlights to the Heinz Fellows Program. So that uh, in year two, um, Dr. Rich Milner, um, left as the direct executive director uh, for the Center for Urban Education, and we welcome Dr. Elon Dancy. Um, and anytime there's a shift in leadership, you know that can be a challenge because a new leader brings their own priorities, their own ideas, um, you know, their own ways of knowing and being in the world. But truly, um, it was also a highlight for us because. While doctors uh, Milner and Dancy are two really different um, scholar practitioners, they both bring a love of um, education, of history, of scholarship, right? And they're both really servant leaders in terms of how they support the staff that works with them, right? And so then in year three, we had another um, change in leadership, which occurred a little bit more closely to the Heinz Fellows. Um, I believe you heard Dakota mention um, our very own Dr. Kenny Donaldson, who was the director of um, the Heinz Fellows Program um, from years one through uh, year three. Um, Dr. Donaldson is out on the uh, West Coast at UCLA repping um, as the athletic associate director there. And then I stepped into the leadership role. Um, at the same time, as Spencer pointed out, we were um, expanding our school sites um, at the onset of a global pandemic. And again, I, I think and I hope that you know the team would agree that while there were certainly challenges, right? Because Kenny and I are both dynamite leaders, but we both have very different styles, right? We both had different priorities, um, different realities that we were facing um, that really, you know, um, spoke to how we led um, the teams that we were on. And so, um, again, though it was a highlight, right? Because it was an opportunity for us to all grow together, um, for us to all really learn each other in some new deeper ways and really, um, put a lot of what we practice, um, a lot of what we preach into practice, you know, amongst ourselves. One of the other things that was really important for me um, as the leader of this program in year three, uh, as it relates to shifting with our circumstances is that when COVID happened, um, the Hans Fellows really just showed up and showed out, right? Um, the innovation, um, the dopeness, you know, that these Heinz fellows bring to this program was like on full display, right? And so 
what we had was Heinz Fellows um, working with Pit Serves in the Home with Children's Village to do outreach calls and resource calls to um, local families. We had Heinz Fellows who were participating in um, parades for their school sites, neighborhood drive-throughs, right? Um, so that students could still see um, not only their school staff, but their Heinz Fellows um, support system. Uh, we had Heinz Fellows who were um, at school sites during um, food and packet distribution, right? And so, and even as Spencer mentioned, you know, we had Heinz Fellows who were making those outreach to um, outreach calls to families, to students. Um, and often we were able to get in touch with families and students when school sites could not. And I think that's really, um, that can't not be stated, right? Because it really speaks to, um, again, the dedication, the commitment, the innovation, right? And the authenticity with which we do this work in this program. Um, and I just wanted to add that before we uh, moved into year four. And I seen a question, um, at least I thought I seen a hand raised, but I don't see it anymore. So I'm gonna go on mute and turn it back over to whoever's taking year four. Thank you, Shalegra. Um, so year four, we had remote collaboration um, and kind of piggybacking off of year three, we wanted to be extremely intentional with our major foci on building really critical mentorships with our students and also kind of branching that out to the community like we were doing. And of course, we ran into some hiccups a little bit with being in the pandemic. So it had as much highlights as it did challenges. But our other goal was when collaborating with the school sites, we wanted to create, we wanted to create very equity oriented professional learning spaces for educators, for students, for community leaders, for admin. Um, and we wanted to do our best to serve in response to the COVID-19 pandemic um, with so many people dying, with so many families having to navigate virtual learning. Um, we, we started realizing that our focuses were aligning with making youth enrichment programs and also being very adaptive as Heinz Fellows or so so easily have done throughout the years. Um, so keeping that lineage going, um, there's multiple programs that we did out of school. There's programs that we did in school. Um, and I can speak as far as for the rest of the um, rest of the cohort as well, that everyone did above and beyond. Like we were like a jack of all trades this year. Um, with navigating virtual space, with navigating um, with navigating the hybrid learning, with reaching out to families, with doing supply drops, and um, and I'm going to pass it to Rachel because she's really going to get into the highlights and challenges that really highlighted and emphasized who we were as Heinz Fellows. Thank you. Um, and so I think obviously the COVID-19 pandemic was one of the largest challenges, most unexpected challenges that we faced. Um, going into this year, building relationships with these school personnel and students and communities. Um, but out of the pandemic, while there was this frenzy of what are our roles going to be? How are we going to fit into the larger pictures of how these schools are moving forward under these circumstances? Um, there were opportunities to collaborate with community organizations and to be further integrated into Q projects. Um, some examples of our community partnerships were that some fellows supported the A-plus schools family hotlines, answering phone questions um, from parents, from caregivers, as they're trying to figure out, um, you know, where to, they're trying to get answers to questions about what's about to happen. Um, about when school will be starting, about where to pick up their tech, all of these sorts of things, what um, online child care support options are there. Whatever questions that they have, there were Heinz Fellows um, supporting that hotline to answer them and connect them with resources. Also, many Heinz Fellows supported the community learning hubs um, where students were able to be in spaces and learn together um, during the pandemic, um, as well as participating in 
the Pittsburgh Village projects, um, some idea sharing meetings with them. And so while we were experiencing this pandemic and a bit of role confusion, um, we were always looking for opportunities to respond to the pandemic and to work with the community organizations that surround and support the schools. Um, similarly with the Center for Urban Education where we are embedded, um, there were, there were Heinz Fellows working with the Retired Teacher Project, working with the Ready to Learn Math Mentoring Program, as well as the Grow Stow Rocks Professional Development Series. Um, another challenge stemming from the pandemic was virtual learning and engagement and even relationship building as a cohort, like within our program. Something that was really meaningful for me, impactful for all of us, were book studies as learning and affinity spaces this year. Three titles that we explored were Sister Outsider by Audre Lorde, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Freire, and um, Permission to Feel by Mark Brackett. And so we dove into these topics of identity, of oppression, of, of emotionality, being invited into school and learning and professional spaces. And these were really powerful spaces to connect with one another, to discuss our experiences, um, and to reconcile with the ways that we can embody both, both um, oppressed identities and privileged identities and doing that personal work that is so necessary before going into school sites and working with students and working along educators. We also received training in, um, in how to do a lead, uh, sorry, how to do a healing circle. And um, we participated in listening circles with school partners throughout the year um, as, and as an employee of the University of Pittsburgh, going into school sites, going into communities, um, again, one of the challenges of navigating roles and responsibilities, navigating what your place is in these school sites, um, but it also can be helpful to have an outside perspective, to be an observer, to be fresh eyes. Um, and so we were welcome to have listening circles with school partners that were very restorative to talk about the things that we're seeing, to talk about what we have to offer, what we would love to support them with, um, and what they would want or need from us. Also school site projects, cross school site projects. Um, one example is Project HEAL, which you'll be hearing about, um, but a lot of fellows, because I think of the virtual landscape that we were navigating, found opportunities to work across school sites um, and bring students together and and um, come up with common goals across school sites um, to, meet, to meet needs, to create spaces for students' artistic expression, socio-emotional development. Um, and so there was really a blending of what the challenges were and what the highlights were as, as we navigated this unprecedented year. And Rachel, I just wanna piggyback on that, right? Because as you were sharing, I realized, um, two other highlights that came out of year four, right? In our remote reality. Um, one was that in the Heinz Fellows program, we found really creative ways to be in community in real life together. Um, during the warmer months, uh, we alternated between two parks um, where, you know, we were able to appropriately physical distance. Um, you know, it was not mandatory, obviously, um, but, you know, because we knew that it was important that we be able to actually like see each other's um, body language, right? Read those um, that that un, that um, the nonverbal cues, right? Um, and for me, probably one of my happiest moments was towards the end of the fellowship when some of our fellows, such as Rachel, who were able to spend most of the program year geographically in another location, um, actually came to Pittsburgh, you know, by then um, rates of um, vaccination had increased. And, you know, we had all of us um, in, in physical space together at least one time, right, over the course of a remote um, learning and working reality. And I think that was just really big because you know, any time that we would schedule that time to meet in real life, you know, fellows were excited. Um, they wanted to be in in community with each other in real life. And I, I just think that really speaks to who we are and how we do our work. Um, 
something else that was a highlight for me that I realized as I listened um, to each of you share this year by year story is that at least from my experience, we probably had one of our best years of school-based um, involvement and interaction. And I'm sure that, you know, the virtual reality um, helped facilitate that, right? Because um, many of us were able to multitask in ways, you know, that we weren't able to when we were physically moving around buildings and, you know, going from school to school. Um, and so, as Rachel said, we were able to have really deep, um, restorative um, listening circles with school administrators and, and teachers. Um, you know, I do a, a, a recurring liaison check-in, you know, with um, the school site partners that uh, when we were operating, you know, in person um, would sometimes get canceled, would sometimes be delayed because, you know, we're operating in real life and things come up. But the commitment that was demonstrated from our school partners um, over this fourth program year, um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that because again, we just were able to forge um, relationships in a much deeper way with um, our school site partners. And we had many school site partners this year, right? We were in six different schools, um, Pittsburgh Obama, Pittsburgh Westinghouse, uh, Pittsburgh Wild, Pittsburgh Miller, Manchester Academic Charter School, AKA Max and Woodland Hills. And Max actually has two different physical locations. And so that's really critical. And that's really a highlight um, that I'm particularly proud of being connected to this program. Who's up next? Good morning, that would be us. Thank you so much. Um, so good morning, everybody. Myself, Rodney and Spencer will now move you through um, a presentation of our cross school site project, Project Heal, which was a virtual after school creative program, our space. We met once a week with fourth and fifth grade students at Miller African Centered Academy where Spencer and I had been working and Manchester Academic Charter School where Rodney had been working. Um, so we'll just give you a little overview, what we do and why, and and with some takeaways. But before we start, we just wanted to take a minute to come together and settle our minds and bodies. Um, and we invite you to just take a minute, close your eyes if you're comfortable with that, um, and just take a few breaths. And while you do this, think about, we'd like you to reflect on what healing means to you and or has meant to you in the past. So we'll just take a minute to do that to recenter ourselves. Thank you. All righty. So the dictionary defines healing as a verb referring to a wound, injury, person that's becoming sound or healthy again. In psychology, it defines it as alleviating or attempting to alleviate mental or physical illness using the power of the mind. And now we're just going to show you how like we define heal. Um, Hello, everyone. Um, healing to me is a process of restoration um, promoted through expression. For me, healing is regenerative, so it's cultivating this harm from the past into something transformative. Yes, and healing to me is the process of repairing what has been harmed and or damaged to make the body, mind, and soul whole again. Healing is essentially therapeutic. To put this into practice, we wanted to create a space um, for Black students to explore their identities, their experiences, as well as provide an emotional outlet through creative expression. Um, the ideal for this space came in response to the pandemic, uh, which made prioritizing emotional well being um, and social connections important. However, um, the pandemic or not, um, the approach to creating HEAL, as well as the program itself can contribute a lot to the conversation of forging futures in education. So moving into what we do and why, um, we wanted to overview the acronym and we were intentional about choosing the words that are in that. So um, holistic expression and liberation. 
the holistic component come describes the approach and the framework that we use to create heal we took a holistic approach to arts education which aligns with these black educational histories and abolitionist teaching frameworks um, that center students that recognize that students have these experiences and issues particular to a moment and a place in history and holistic arts education approach aims to use art as a tool through which thoughts and feelings are processed so that we might better know ourselves more fully in the world. And uh, with expression, we wanted to we wanted to frame creative expressions as going beyond traditional conceptions of art. Um, for example, painting, drawing, uh, music. We framed our program as creative expression so we could acknowledge um, the many forms of creative expressions that exist. Yes, and and it's funny how I always say and because the and is just a. Um, but it also leads into the liberation. And in holistic art education, it relies on a lot of problem posing, asking deeper questions. Rather than teaching students how to make something, it teaches students how to think about something. In order to move genuinely towards liberatory education, we must, and I repeat, like we must, allow students the space to build their own critical consciousness. So concrete examples of how our program ran, I, I mentioned it was once a week. Um, we're gonna share a few examples of how we created a space that, or strove to create a space that was equitable and centered holistic creative expression. So one was the art boxes, and you can kind of see this in the picture. Um, there's a few pictures of them here on our slide. Um, and this was really about equity of resources and from past educational histories, we recognize that inaccessibility to resources has been a barrier for forging educational futures. So in our programming, we didn't want to assume that all students had access to the same materials. We created and distributed art boxes that contained materials that students would use throughout the program. Um, and to talk about the curriculum and the weekly themes, um, we created a curriculum based around the weekly things, including, for example, like identity, community, joy, which allow for flexibility uh, based on the student feed, students' feedback. We also prioritized some, um, emotional check-ins uh, that we conducted each week, um, at the, especially at the start of the, the meetings in creative ways, such as like weather check-ins where we pretended to be weathermen or weather women, um, meteorologists. Um, uh, we did an emoji chart, as well as uh, facial expression check-ins, as you can see on the, um, the image at the top right. And yeah, and so we were also extremely intentional about taking the time to discuss the themes with the students in depth, as well as the important things that were going on throughout the world. Um, one of our weeks, we actually had the shift with the George Floyd, Derek Chauvin case, and our whole lesson plan kind of ended up being shifted to a very social justice equity based talk that had to do with their relationship with cops, how they perceive the relationship with cops. And so we wanted to take that time not to, to make them feel like they were heard and also give them, give them the space and time to ask the questions that they might not be able to ask in school or to integrate it into their feelings. Because as we all know, art has a lot to do with how one is feeling in the moment. And lastly, I just wanna emphasize the, um, the studio time aspect of our meeting. So this was the time where students really were creating. Um, and this was, I think, the, the part of our program that we shifted the most and you know, were responsive mm -hmm. to what was working in the virtual space and what was not but um, it was designed intentionally with open-ended questions to prompt art making where um, instead of more like step-by-step, -step, okay, we're gonna make this project, here's step one, here's step two, but rather like spurring creativity through prompts such as for the week of purpose, you know, we asked them, one of the things we asked them was what is something you can teach us? And they would create based on these open-ended prompts. And if we could please go to the next slide. Thank you. Um. So just to kind of discuss some of these uh, highlights, best practices and challenges, under highlights and best practices, one of the things that um, we wanted to be sure that the students were centered at all times. Um, I think Rodney mentioned it, that you know we oftentimes shifted, 
shifted the lesson plans and we 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 pretty much let them run the show uh, based off of their feelings, based off of their thoughts, based off of the things that are going on in their worlds. Um, so we were very responsive and, and we that that flexible curriculum was very uh, vital to the um, to the program. Another thing from this list we'd like to highlight is our own organizational approach. So we wanted to create a space for our own debrief after each um, session that we held. We commit ourselves to revision, to reflecting on our own identities and how we show up in a space. Um, and we just really essentially wanted to strive to model ways of being that we wanted for our students and for the HEAL space. And yeah, and so as we talk about all of the highlights that we had went into and there was a ton, um, those didn't come with some quirks and some challenges. And a lot of it was really just centered around the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the virtual setting was a challenge, I would say, for every educator in the field this year. Um, you know, a lot of logistical planning. Um, we used to talk about in our meetings all the time um, in the debrief spaces on how we would go about executing the activities when we would need to change things on the fly, getting the feedback from the students. And with everybody's schedule being so different, parents, students, um, relationship building at the beginning was a challenge. We got it to work though, which we're extremely grateful for everyone that um, came out and everyone that got a chance to express themselves in the space. Um, and also with that, um, attendance and retention. So uh, we've got, we had really good attendance overall However, it goes just back to the time constraints and everything else. When you have families that need to go certain places, when you switch to hybrid and you have to get off and now you have to go back home, sometimes it doesn't constrict. Like we had ended up doing the program for like an hour and a half. So we would do from four o'clock to about five, five thirty and just let the conversation go. Um, and just engagement sometimes, you know, when and these a lot of these things that we're talking about are like at the beginning, the beginning of understanding what we were doing, having them be comfortable with us, because as every mentor knows, as every teacher educator should know, you have to build trust and that trust leads to engagement. Um, and I already kind of spoke to like the time constraints. And so even in, uh, even in like our takeaways of it, and how we're like reflecting and looking back on the three or so months that we had done heal. Um, we really were very, very grateful, appreciative, and proud of how heal itself was able to develop a culturally responsive and yet reflective curriculum. Um, Again, the prioritization of the socio-emotional well-being um, for the students, for ourselves, even for the parents, and letting the energy just flow organically and letting things just come. Instead of forcing it, we, we engaged with them and showed them that we're just kind of here and we're here for y'all, like not the other way around. And in that, we were able to cultivate a space for students and us as the facilitators to want to express themselves. And we also feel like overall, this was just a great contribution to forging black futures in education, primarily in so giving them the confidence in the dreaming to go after what they want. And we were going to leave you all with a quote. Holistic liberation mitigates the obstacles that prevent you from living an empowered life. And we will now pass it on to the next presentation. Alrighty, uh, before I say anything about the project that I will be highlighting, the first thing I wanna say is I love you all. I love that I got to work with you all. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. Um, I'm so happy to know you. Um, so Rodney, Spencer, and Meg did a great job of highlighting a project that the cohort uh, worked on this year that benefited students and uh, families. I'm going to focus on a project that worked with teachers and staff. And so 
Uh, today, I'm gonna to speak to you about the Woodland Hills High School Teacher and Staff Equity Coalition. Um, this was a project that was co-facilitated by myself and Jasmine Howard, who I mentioned earlier, who was another one of the Heinz Fellows at Woodland Hills. Um, just some quick things about the program overview. I wanted to focus on identities as well as logistics. So we were very intentional about thinking through the fact that myself as a white trans woman and a black cis woman were the two voices co-facilitating our time with the teachers and staff. And so we were consistently thinking about in terms of our curriculum, how that would influence the perspectives and ideas that we brought into the space um, for our activities and conversations. Um, but when we think about our group members, there were four teachers, there was a school social worker and a school building administrator. I'll let you read some of the details about their identities on this slide. And so we were very aware of the fact that our conversation, and this is very true throughout the Pittsburgh region, as well as in many of our school communities, was pretty centered on racial identities of blackness and whiteness. And so we wanted to surface those narratives. We wanted to surface a lot of the dominant ideas around education, what good education is, what successful education spaces look like, as well as provide some counter narratives and some more equitable and radical alternatives so that we would be able to use a lot of information and thrive based on information from Black educational histories in order to forge new futures in the school space at Woodland Hills. We met digitally via Zoom. Um, and we began this program in January, and we had four successful meetings with the cohort. We did have some scheduling issues, which I'll speak to on the next slide. But so we had four meetings, and those meetings were built around four separate topics. The first was the cycle of socialization. Some of you might be familiar with Bobby Haro's work. Um, we used this meeting to first set up some group dynamics, um, shared agreements for our work together, understand why these teachers and staff were interested in being part of the Equity Coalition, as well as to begin exploring our own identities as facilitators and group members around our privileged and oppressed identities and how those identities intersect. We then had a second meeting, um, which was built around engaging in relationship across differences. So this explored how we engage in relationship with colleagues who are in a lateral position to us that hold different cultural identities, but also how we um, interact with students and families who may hold different cultural identities through the imbalanced power dynamics of schooling. And so how teachers and staff who often hold outsized positions of power within the school system, how were we interacting with those students and families who might have similar or different cultural identities to us, depending on who we are and how we show up in this space. Our third meeting uh, was around how we, how this work can be sustained and really intentionally not how Jasmine and I would be supporting the sustaining of this work, but how the teachers and staff who would continue to be part of the Woodland Hills community over the years were planning to sustain this work. And our final meeting was focused on being in right relationship. And so we used this time to reflect on the topics that we had discussed and think more about not just what does it mean to be in relationship with those we serve, but how can we interrupt some of those power inequities and how can we really be responsive to cultural identity so that we are in right relationship with students and families as representatives of school systems. So what were some of the highlights and what were some of the challenges of this program? I'm gonna start with the challenges and then I'm going to end on a high note. So our first challenges were really around time and attendance. As I said, we began meeting in January um, as we recognized that there was interest in a program like this over the course of the first half of the year. And so we necessarily only had a few months to work with the team and they were only available to meet once a month given all of the various um, priorities of hybrid instruction, virtual learning, and just generally pandemic fatigue and stress level that we were all experiencing. The virtual environment does make it more difficult to do this work at times because there is a decrease in our ability to have deep uh, 
connections in physical space with each other. As Shawagra said earlier, the fact that I can see someone's nonverbal communication, the fact that I could see the bottom half of their body if we were in the same physical space in ways that um, are not as available to us virtually. And also I think because of that, a potential decrease in our willingness to be deeply authentic and deeply transparent all the time. I don't know how you all feel, but in this digital space, I have often felt that emotional transparency is so much more difficult or has so many more stakes to it because of this lack of physical connection. Uh, a big challenge that we experienced also was being responsive to internalized whiteness in the moment. So we knew we had four or five sessions planned at the beginning of our program in January. And we had chosen topics that we were going to discuss based on the expressed needs of the group. And so we, uh, in the hour long sessions that we had with them had to be constantly shifting and thinking about how are we covering this necessary information that we have on the agenda, as well as responding in the moment to comments that might be made that underneath them have a lot of assumptions around internalized racial superiority or internalized racial oppression. Um, how are we responding to these dominant narratives around education, who a good student is, who a good teacher is, what a good community is. And so we were constantly working to shift and facilitate those conversations as best as we could. So now that we've talked about challenges, what were the highlights? Well, we came in building on the work of a really committed group of teachers and staff who had already done some racial equity work in the past. There were teachers who had previously attended QCEF. There were social workers who had previously engaged in their own professional development around racial equity and other forms of equity. And so we really had the opportunity to build off of a foundation that already existed. And we had representatives from all levels of the school staff. So it was great to have at least one member of the building administration team, as well as teachers, as well as social workers, because it meant that we were engaging with adults in the school building who would interact with students and families in a variety of ways throughout the school day and throughout the school year. We were able to, because of our connection with the Center for Urban Education, um, use some amazing equity-driven readings and resources to frame our conversation. Um, as an example, we used an article by Dr. Rich Milner around positionality and what some of the seen, unseen, and unforeseen dangers can be in classrooms when teachers and researchers don't reflect on their positionality in the classroom. And that led to some fruitful conversations with the group. And even despite the fact that we were virtually engaged, um, staff did report at the end of our time together, greater connection with those participants who had been a part of the Equity Coalition and higher confidence to engage other colleagues who had not been a part of the coalition's um, proceedings. And so the Heinz Fellows throughout the year had provided some PDs to the whole staff on equity topics. We had been infused in different classrooms and after school opportunities with teachers and students, but the teachers and staff who engaged in this coalition felt that as they move forward into the end of the school year and next year, they too could be empowered agents within the school community to be bringing these conversations to their colleagues and reinforcing the school's commitment to this work. And now um, we have some time for questions um, and interaction with all of you who have been uh, engaging with us so far. So what has stood out to you? What parts of the program do you still have questions about? What details of these projects that we've looked at in greater depth might you have questions about? Or are you looking for ways that you might do this sort of work in your own spaces and want to hear some reflections from us? So the floor is open. And so Dakota, while we wait for questions to come in, um, so we don't have, you know, uh, dead space, I'm gonna ask each of you to share with us, uh, which may in fact spark some questions. And thank you for um, putting Q's email address 
um, up in case folks think of questions, thoughts uh, later, they can always email us and someone will get back to them. Um, but I would like to know from each of you, what has been your greatest challenge being connected to this fellowship and what is like a significant way that you've grown as a result of being connected to this fellowship experience? Um, and I'll start with <laughs> Shalegra, who doesn't really work here, is also a mind reader because that was someone's question in the audience. Thank you, Haley Jane Porter. Um, so I'll start with um, DJ Pivo. All right. I don't know how I knew you were going to pick me up. Because <laughs> you're a All mind right. reader too? I think so. I think so. Um, one of the greatest assets um, of the program for me has been because my my background was in education. So gaining that sense of community to, to rethink um, the way we approach education, the way we approach mentorship and, and, and so forth. Um, one of the challenges that I faced um, was COVID, was around COVID. Um, because it hit it hit me really hard because I knew some of the realities of some of the students. I knew some of the realities of, you know, how one mentee in particular had so many siblings that needed attention. And so he came to school for that attention. He came to school for that nurturing. And, you know, when I would talk to him, he he would be struggling. And that was hard for me. That was hard for me because I, you know, built that relationship with them. I kind of, you know, tried my best to spend a little bit of extra time with them because I knew that to what he he needed. Um, and to, to, to provide that really, you know, those phone conversations and those virtual meetings uh, face to face on, on the computer. Um, it just didn't hit the same for neither one of us. So that was a that was a huge struggle for me. Um, did I answer both questions? Um, did you tell us how you've grown? Oh, most no significant um, listen area of growth. One of the ways that I've grown um, for myself um, is the different approaches that I take to different scenarios with students um, to to kind of grasp uh, relationships. This program has really taught me about relationships with students building those on set relationships and critical mentoring and, you know, getting understanding more so um, the interest of the students and, you know, advocating for them when sometimes they can't advocate for themselves, um, especially in some of these educational spaces where they are, you know, talked to any kind of way, they are treated as though, you know, they're not necessarily, um, unfortunately human. Um, so, I feel like I've grown like in those particular spaces and shout out to Kenny, uh, shout out to Schlegger, shout out to Kenny, shout out to um, Dr. Milner, Dr. Dancy and everybody at Q. Uh, I miss y'all. I really do miss y'all. So, and that was a hard, hard part for me transitioning from Q into the space that I am now. While it, some of the conversations overlap, uh, it's different, it's different. So. I thank y'all. I thank all of you all. So, you know, for those who don't know me, <laughs> I am a crier and um, my eyes are a watering. KD, Kenny Donaldson, thank you. We appreciate the shout out. Thank you for fertilizing um, this program for me <laughs> in such a way that I would be able to come in and move the work to the next level. And so I'm gonna take this opportunity to answer that question myself. I typically either go last or try to get out of it, but one of the greatest lessons I've learned since being connected to this program actually came by way of Spencer Scott. Um, whew, you know, um, 
as we would do when we were actually in the Center for Urban Education, we would uh, convene in, in the conference room around the table. And it's almost like a dinner table, right? A dining room table. And we would just have these rich discussions and there'd be multiple discussions going on. And um, I remember, you know, setting some goals and saying, you know, when I turn this age, I'm gonna do this. And when I turn this age, I'm gonna do that. When I turn that age, I'm gonna do this. And Spencer said to me after sharing a very, um, a very wonderful and deep moving story with me that like now is the time, <laughs> um, you know, now is the time because we don't know what tomorrow holds. And so Spencer, you know, I, I, I know that I've shared this story with you um, before, but I just want you to know that I think of that conversation with you um, often, regularly, daily, Right, and it is helping to inform me, and it is making me a better person, a better educator, and a better and a better leader. Um, and so, that is certainly one of the most important things that I have taken away from this program. And the reality is, um, Erica, Victoria, Rachel, Rodney, Haley, uh, Matthew, Jordan, Jasmine, Dakota, Daniel. Did I miss anybody? I feel like Angela, like J Jamal Gosa, who's not with us, but is, you know, once a fellow, always a fellow, like each of you have deposited something rich into me um, that informs my practice, my, my leadership, um, and my service to the world. Um, I would say probably the most challenging aspect of this work, uh, being, you know, connected to this program is um, knowing how much more impact we could have made in our school partners um, had we had the time, um, had we had um, an alignment of our priorities, um, had we been able to define those roles much sooner and get the buy-in, you know, um, from different levels of school administration much sooner. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, who would like to share next? And then I do see some questions coming in. Uh, Julie, I'm gonna answer your question as soon as the rest of these folks go. Um, Dakota, why don't you go next? I will because I actually wanna tie part of a response to Julie's question into my answer. So um, I actually have, two challenges that push me to grow that are tied for most important. One is personal, one is professional. So I'll start with the personal one. Um, I began transitioning a year ago. Um, in fact, yesterday was exactly a year ago, June 18th of 2020. And uh, so I entered a work experience with some folks that I already knew and a lot of folks who I didn't know. Um, at the beginning of a gender transition. And not many workspaces are necessarily safe spaces for a person going through that experience. Um, and it can't always be guaranteed that even school, public school spaces will be safe spaces for folks of queer and trans identities. And so um, I was challenged this year to really advocate for myself and to stand in my own truth in ways that previously I had not been comfortable. I took, I've told this to the cohort before, I took 11 years to decide whether I would or would not transition from the time that I first started thinking about it when I was 18 or 19 years old. And so stepping into that space to, uh, to really be my most authentic self and to be able to do my best work was very difficult. And I'm thankful that I had um, not only colleagues, but also students and uh, fellow educators at my school site that really pushed me to take on that challenge. Um, professionally speaking, I think that to go off of something Spencer said, this was just a really difficult year to be a person who cares about young people. I think that in the work that we do, when we work with students who hold vulnerable identities. It's, it's hard to be a person who cares about young people any day. Um, but I worked with students this year who went through immensely traumatic experiences, in particular a student whose mother passed away in the middle of the year. 
um, and who was having trouble turning schoolwork in on time, who was very stressed about his grades. Um, and it really pushed me to find new ways to interact with students, to both learn how to step back when necessary to give them space and agency, and also to meet them in new digital ways, whether that was through Google Classroom, whether that was through Gchat, whether that was through Discord, um, finding ways to maintain those relationships and provide support necessarily from afar. And this is where uh, my response to Julie's question comes in. So Julie is asking us, based on our work from the past years, what advice do we have for classroom teachers as they work to support students during the transition from remote instruction or hybrid instruction back to hopefully full in-person learning. So um, I would say the most important piece is just to recognize that school in terms of like academic content and Pennsylvania Department of Education standards and all of those things is in my opinion, not the priority of what we're doing at this moment in time. Um, which is not to say that we should lower our standards for students' excellence, which is not to say that we are not here to provide wisdom and education to students, but simply that we are, we are being called to no longer do that in such a way that prioritizes an extremely harmful system and its way of teaching, right? And so um, I think the most important thing that teachers and other educators and staff can do coming back into this school year is to really take up a space of political advocacy um, alongside students and families, whether that is going to school board meetings, whether that's speaking to legislators, whether that's writing to the PDE, um, to begin to really force these systems to create equitable education environments, to create environments that humanize our students and families to create curricula that are more inclusive, to create co-curricular experiences that allow all students to be seen and valued. I don't think we anymore have the time or opportunity to say that we are being forced to take up a very small particular role in the schooling system of, I have to teach this content, or I have to coach this team, or I have to run this after school group. I think we need to recognize that education is a political endeavor and that we have a responsibility as agents within this space to take up true equity and justice efforts. And so I would say um, really engage with students and families around their needs and what they would like to see from the school district or from the state that they are not seeing, and then find ways that coalitions of teachers and other educators can really push us to begin that much deeper systemic work. Well, go ahead and drop the mic, why don't you? Rachel. <laughs> Hello. Um, my biggest challenge, I think, was one or one of the major challenges was definitely logistical as far as um, changing schedules because of the virtual context that we were um, embedded in. Um, so like I'm working with one teacher and just regular life things. I'm working with one teacher she goes on maternity leave, now I've got a new teacher, but then they go and they transition to a part-time in-person model. So then my schedule changes. So just having to be flexible to everything that was going on this year. Um, I think, so as far as growth, um, two themes for me in my personal life and in this fellowship were bearing witness. Um, and so, especially engaging in the book studies that I was talking about before, thinking about the ways that a lot of times with our school and with our working or corporate systems, the idea is you have to do your healing at home so that you can be perfectly prepared to be productive in spaces of learning and, and work. Um, and being a part of this dynamic fellowship experience where we were so encouraged to take our whole selves into the space, um, it was really important for me to learn how to bear witness to other people and also bear witness for myself. Um, I think having an emphasis on restoration, having an emphasis on harm reduction, having an emphasis on um, speaking the things that need to be said was really important for me and my personal growth as a leader this year. Um, and that fits into um, Julie's question of, you know, what 
what can we do? What do we recommend in these school sites, in these school districts? Um, and something I really appreciated about my school site, Manchester Academic Charter School, was a bit of flexibility to the schedule having space dedicated to prepare for things with students, um, to prepare, to respond, to share um, before the move back to hybrid, the move back to like some students in person on some days, some students in person on other days, some students not coming in person at all. Um, we had these afternoon sessions that could be a study hall. They were SEL circles. They were, um, you know, sitting with students and, and analyzing current events, analyzing laws that should have been taken away, like the sagging pants law should have been taken away years ago. And instead it's like within the past 10. Um, and so just having that space to, to talk about identity, to talk about oppression, to talk about our emotions, to talk about what we're all experiencing, that time was so critical. Um, and wherever possible, having that flexibility, having that buffer to invite students and your own as a teacher or a social worker or administrator your own um, humanity into the space. Mm, that's good, Rachel. Um, and I want to say thank you for um, inviting me into the book study. Uh, you know, as I said, and as I always say, you know, um, you all give me so much. Um, you all give me so much. Um, and I still marvel right, at what I learned about myself, um, what I learned about my ways of being in the world um, from your invitation to the book study um, with Audre Lorde, right? And so thank you for that. Spencer, I wanted to bring you back on and give you an opportunity to answer um, Julia's question um, before I move to uh, Meg. Um. My advice is, and basically was stated earlier a little bit, uh, make sure the students are centered. Um, as I stated earlier, I have a background in education. I taught um, uh, in Alabama before moving to Pittsburgh. Um, and while as a teacher, it may feel, feel difficult um, with all of the, um, the different demands and the different personalities in the space and um, trying to make sure you're fulfilling the academic needs um, before you do anything. Make sure the, the students are at the center of it all. Um, make sure those relationships are there um, because this is this is really going to be like no other. Um, for students not seeing their, an entire class uh, in over a year to, you know, coming back with everybody it may be overwhelming for some, it may be overwhelming for you. Um, I don't know, but make sure you 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 also practice some self-care uh, before, after, uh, whatever the case may be, make sure you, you're you centering yourself after you leave the space um, to, to recenter and to allow you, yourself to reflect on um, the pros and cons of everything that, that has happened. Um, that's really all I um, have, but also make sure you also tie in, in your um, administration. I know they're mm -hmm. maybe stretched thin, um, mm -hmm. but make sure you're doing that as well because the reason why we're all in these educational spaces are the students. And while they may or may not be aware, but sometimes we think about them more than they will ever know. And if your administration, um, I'm gonna just say this, your administration um, has an opportunity uh, to help you. And so hopefully they'll take it. So, yeah. But Thank they you. won't be able to if we don't let them know what we exactly. need, yeah, right? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Thank you, Spencer. Meg. Yeah, so I think the challenge, one of the challenges for me um, was being in this virtu predominantly virtual space was, and being a first year fellow, so kind of being an outsider coming in. And also based on my um, 
my own social identities, racial identity, ethnic identity that I carry coming into a, a new school site, predominantly virtually um, with a predominantly African-American student population and just, I guess, building relationships with staff, building relationships with students and families. Um, it took longer in the virtual space, I believe. And, and it's, but it was all the more necessary to be able to do a lot of the work that we as Heinz Fellows were called to do. Um, and so for instance, working with um, admin and working with teachers and, um, and then also like outreach to families and connecting with students. And I worked with a kindergarten classroom. So it was also, I think another component of that was like confronting these realities of in demands at a district level and school level, um, which were often contradictory to like these goals we had coming into the space as Heinz Fellows. And so gaining that trust and building those relationships so that we might confront those contradictions. Um, and I guess a, an advice I have is also just, you know, I was working with very young students in school, but like never underestimating the capacity they have to understand these experiences they have um, and to talk about those. Um, and that we might be able to, you know, in some ways infiltrate these curriculums that are imposed at a district level, at a national level, in small ways even, you know, and, and for instance, if that's not validating the curriculum or not, or how can we learn, you know, how can students learn sight words, but not read this very, you know, Eurocentric, very white, very mainstream book about it, you know, could we choose a different book and like seeing things as little as that, I think, are important. Um, and then I guess just connecting to that, the ways in which I've grown, um, there is this urgency when you work with young people, um, when you work with students about like knowing you and knowing who you are, knowing how you show up in spaces. And I think this year um, was a heavy year of reflection on that for me. Who am I in, in um, this urban education fellowship? Who am I in, in Miller? Who am I in Pittsburgh? Um, mm -hmm. And so that was really important for me. And then also just like, growing in my creativity and ability to engage in social imagination as you know like abolitionist teacher frameworks put it as dr bettina love who visited university of pittsburgh earlier this year just thinking about ways in which we can do things differently um is challenging but i think i've grown a lot in that as well and rodney you're up all righty. Um, I would start with challenges. Um, challenges was honestly was life. Um, just the first pandemic we all been through. So uh, <laughs> and when we look at it as far as um, education, and then we also look at it as far as like self, um, we got a really big look at, we got a, a virtual look at everyone's lives through a tiny little screen. Um, and so dealing with um, students feeling the effects of the pandemic, not seeing their friends, um, family members that they could not see, and then also family members that they weren't, um, that had been affected by COVID. I look at myself and looking at family members um, and friends that were affected by the pandemic. And then I also look at like, um, and a couple of fellows that already spoke to it, just a logistical thing. It was always, it seemed like everything was always changing. It was like, all right, we got classes here. Okay, we're changing the schedule here. All right, now we're going hybrid. Okay, now we're doing this. And I say it as a challenge because I don't think it was a problem. It just was something that had to be done. And we were all kind of building a plane in the air as you will. Um, this was new to everyone. And so I would say going off of that, it showed me a lot about, it gave me a better glimpse of how I'm showing up when I'm doing the work. Um, because, and this will also kind of tie into Julie's question as well. Um, it's hard to show up for other people when you're not showing up for yourself. And so students see that, um, your family relatives see that, they might not say it all the time, but they see it and they can feel it. And so, being that representation of taking that time to Spencer's point to heal yourself, to give yourself some self-care, then you can come whole to give what you need to give for the students around you. Um, another big takeaway is just the adaptability of me and all of my co my, all of my cohort. Like it was so it, it was like innovation overload in a good way. 
because the pandemic has made basically resources out of raisins. Like we have been able, and I've seen school sites from Max um, to Miller to multiple other school sites that we talked about just adapt, change, and thrive in certain senses in trying to reach the students and also meeting students where they're at. So as we're talking about hybrid and remote um, and maybe at the at the end of all of this, like obviously like in person, it's meeting students where we're at. And it's also showing grace because we've all needed grace throughout this entire process. They're gonna need grace. Um, it's connecting with parents and more explicitly, because now parents have also got a glimpse of how their students learn. So now there is even more insight that we as educators can take from that and integrate back into our lesson planning, whether it's in school teaching, whether it's out of school teaching, um, being innovative, looking at, I would say like one thing that really sums it up is like empathy. The empathy of understanding what they need and then trying to integrate that back and using the resources that we have. Um, you use the admin, um, the link between community centers and community-based organizations, because I believe that there needs to be a renaissance of linking back together the oneness of school, community, mindfulness, all of these things sometimes have like an invisible barrier. And we need to bring those things back. So everyone is, it takes a village to raise children. It takes a village for all of us to be the dope individuals that we are. So with that village tribe mindset, that's what's going to help in tough times like this because everybody's still figuring this out. We're just gonna be completely honest. Nobody has this figured out. We don't know what's gonna happen in the fall. We don't know what's gonna happen next week. But the one thing that we can do is show up for ourselves, be authentic with ourselves, and also practice these mindfulness things, practice these asking for community administration helps and getting those resources that we need to give out. Yep. Yep. Wow. Um, Rodney, thank you for taking us on home with that incredible advice and insight. Um, I want to thank you all again for spending this time with the Heinz Fellows Program uh, this morning. Uh, we're gonna take a short break uh, and please make sure you tune back in at 12.30 for our uh, keynote wrap up from um, Dr. Vanessa Siddle Walker and also the closing remarks from Dr. Elon Dancy, Executive Director of the Center for Urban Education and Endowed, uh, Helen S. Faison, Endowed Chair, also Associate Dean of Equity. We, were lot, we have lots of jobs in the center. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I love you to the Heinz Fellows who are here, the ones who are here virtually. You all make me exceedingly proud. It has been an honor and a privilege to work with you all. Be well, take care, happy Juneteenth, and remember, we all possess the power to do better. Thank you.